Good day, hope everyone is doing well. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna do a video. I'm not gonna say a quick video really, because I'm just trying to cover as much as possible. But I'm gonna do a video on just a, a recapitulation video, a recap video of what has been covered thus far and things to look out for. So yeah, let's get right into it. We'll start with an analysis on one of the key topics. So this is from last year, test two from last year. I think this is something you should look at very closely. I'm not gonna share the file. I think if you look at, if you just watch the video, you're able to engage with everything that's happening, right? So yeah, we're going to look at question one where you have an example of patterns of female labor force participation and at least one other relevant example that's being spoken about. So human fertility, fast food consumption, et cetera. And you're required to focus on the leisure definition. Remember earlier, we were talking about how not doing chores um, is leisure, right? Um, but that's where the conceptual precision comes in. You need to be conceptually precise because if you're looking at a very standard economic model, they would say that leisure is any time that you don't spend like any time that you spend not working, right? So to answer this particular question where you are explaining the full income budget constraint and its conceptual imprecision, you need to dive deep into the detail, right? You have to ensure that you capture all the six marks. And this looks like an exam question, so please do pay attention to this. So why is it that this full income budget constraint thing, this concept, FIBC, why is it imprecise? It's imprecise because in the full income approach, all time not spent working, as I explained, is defined as leisure. And this is conceptually imprecise because much time spent not working for money is chores, which are actually work and don't give pleasure, right? So yeah, that's where you'd get your mark. Then you have to address this limitation. So household production, you reconceptualize leisure as the time spent in household production. Um, I think the handout is still a bit, it's more or less the same. I don't know if it has changed, but just check around this page number and then you'll see the relevant explanations. But do try to cover as much ground as possible because if you look at this answer, just there are certain things that are highlighted or underlined rather, underlined in bold. So you're breaking down your, your explanation. You're focusing on keywords, you know, explaining why, this is conceptually precise and talking about full price, talking about full income budget constraints. So try to mention everything, but make sure that the answer is succinct. Um, yeah, so you also just refer to goods as produced by the consumer. So an example would be a meal, clean clothes, et cetera. So you have your explanation and you provide an example. Then when you talk about the full price, you look at the full price, so time and money price of different goods so you get another mark there and then remember we were talking about the um, the woman labor force participation so as women's wages have increased the full price of money intensive goods like fast food has decreased relative to that of time intensive goods so they are simply cheaper in price terms right so here you are explaining the case so the increase of the wage will lead to the full price of other goods decreasing relative to so there's a relationship between money and time that's what you need to pay attention to so then make a comparison because you are linking one case to another so you have your concept and you're explaining it in accordance with what's being said here then it makes economic sense for me to work in the labor market earn wages and buy money intensive goods like fast food appliances etc um yeah so do ensure that you speak a lot about that and why it is critical for women to be to to have more numbers in the, the labor market yeah so then you refer to your thoroughness so you already explain conceptual precision by saying that a certain concept is imprecise and then here you talk about thoroughness so this is thorough because you've explained various observations. So the labor force participation and the change in pattern consumptions of various money and time intensive goods purely in terms of changes in economic factors. So in this case, the wage played a role in how you 
spend on money intensive goods versus time intensive goods right so you are linking everything i hope you get the pattern here right so then we'll move on to the next part i think you're still going to cover this but i also think Jorge, it's important to pay attention to what's being said so explain why it is necessary for one to depart from a strictly choice theoretic framework to fully explain the aforementioned examples right so we cannot assume that the behavior or change in behavior that we observe reflects choice. So if women are not working, this does not mean that they prefer leisure for, for them to engage in household production. So in essence, so either they prefer leisure or it is optimal for them to engage in household production. So um, in the case of like single mothers, you know, they have to take care of their children. They have to make certain sacrifices to ensure that their children are, are better off. Um, so in the event that they actually work, then they would have to hire um, a caregiver who will look after them, who will look after the kids in the absence of the mother while they are working and pursuing an income to ensure that they provide for the household, right? So do expand in that manner. So if people are working rather than taking care of kids, this might not reflect that they prefer this. So there's a lack of preference. And this is where you get your fuller explanation uh, people may have no choice when they face unemployment or they may face dilemmas or exploitation. So you also need to contextualize to say that if I was in this position, where would I be based on the country that I'm in, the context that I'm facing, you know? And then strictly speaking, we are talking about a violation of assumption two on page 61. As I've stated before, I don't know how much the handout has changed, but it hasn't really changed much uh, over the years. So please do pay attention to the violation of certain assumptions. Um, so this also manifests as incompleteness and it might lead to apparently irrational or dependent behavior. So there's no credit in bringing in choice factors or changing taste. You need to ensure that you don't bring up concepts that don't align with what's being said. So talk about the choice theoretic framework because you're aligning one question with the other, like one answer with another. So you cannot assume choice because of circumstance in this case. Um, so don't bring up like you know how you say how you explain conceptual precision and thoroughness and explaining those concepts but not contextualizing those concepts to the questions please be wary of that so be aware of what those concepts mean but be able to apply them to the answers so next question you'll see it right here we will answer number well yeah number three and then letter a so letter a cool the answer is false and it cannot be explained as a compliment because a compliment is a good for which demand for y increases as x increased. And here we can see that x has not increased. So maize meal and meat, they are complementary goods. And yeah, I think everybody know that they are complementary goods, cool. So, and this will be explained by an income effect. And then the price of x increasing, x being pap or maize meal, will lead to a decrease in real income because as you buy something and the price increases, obviously you wanna have less money. And there'll be a decrease in consumption of meat indicating that meat is a normal good. Remember we were talking about inferior goods the other day saying that if the price of chocolate went up, would you still buy it? No, you wouldn't because it's chocolate, you know? Um, yeah, uh, but but yeah, it also speaks to the different elasticities of the goods that are there, right? So yeah, that covers that answer. Then for question B, pay attention to the page numbers so that you can just make reference to what's being said. And big, by the way, stands for basic income grant, basic income grants. Um, so here you are discussing debates about certain options and you are providing the Hicksian and Slutsky definitions of the compensating variation, which was spoken about earlier. And you are using two different approaches, nearly the utilitarian and the rights-based approach. So for those who take politics, for example, they would know of the utilitarianism framework by Jeremy Bentham, you know, but it still applies more or less the same in economics. The only difference between the two is that economics is quantifying your desire for a certain good, your pleasure, your satisfaction, right? Other than that, it's one and the same thing, right? Uh, so yeah, the BIG is a cash payment. And one of the worries is that it will not only it will replace not only other cash grants, but also in-kind welfare. So what is meant by this? Please do Google things that may sound like they 
sound like they make sense, but they like things that you may not know what they mean. So what does in kind welfare mean, right? Um, what is the consequence of the BIG replacing in kind welfare? So we might end up with the state spending less on public goods and you know what these public goods are, they're already here. And justifying this on utilitarian grounds, in other words, or in essence, that it is better to give people money and let them choose. Obviously, this will be based off the assumptions that we have that uh, consumers are rational and independent. So this is one thing you need to open up debate uh, because there are two, two different types of economists. Well, I would say three, but yeah. There are two types, heterodox and orthodox. But if you talk about the third one, it's the one who does not know what type of economists they are, if they're stuck in the middle, right? Um, heterodox being the alternative, orthodox being the mainstream. So the key here is getting the connection between the Hicksian approach, utilitarianism, um, as I explained earlier, and giving people cash payments. And the critique of the utilitarianism and the rights-based approach, right? So being able to take everything and put it into one argument. So already the question is saying discuss. So when you discuss, you need to just give a full picture of what is happening, explaining all the approaches, the differences between the approaches, what is meant by the particular frameworks and how they play a role in answering the question. You know, So the utilitarian logic is that people are utility maximizers and know what's best for themselves. Um, yeah, you know, based on what I just said, rational independence. So, um, if we are worried about their well-being, we should give them cash and let them choose because they think they know what they want. You know, um, in economics, I, um, well, econometrics, which is um, a third-year module uh, where you start to analysis to explain economic theory. One of the assumptions in the, um, if I'm not mistaken, the classical linear regression model is that there is an intrinsic randomness in human behavior. You know, one minute you want to buy one minute you want to cook, the next you want you want to buy fast food, and then you want to cook again, and then you want to buy fast food, all in the space of a minute or so, you know, so there's like randomness and how we want things. Uh, check out behavioral economics, I think that could be something you can look into even for like future research purposes. So concerning ourselves with what people consume interferes with their choice. So if we wanted to restore their full income so that the price increase did not hurt them, we would use the Hicksian approach, which is to give them enough money to get them back to their old level of utility, even if they could no longer afford the original bundle. So that is the utilitarian logic. So utilitarian is all centered around how do we make the consumer happy? How do we make it about the consumer, right? How do we ensure that the consumer is getting the best option for them that will satisfy them? So the criticism of this is the rights-based approach and it's associated with um, Slatsky and it links to giving the full parcel. So if the price of some important good like meat goes up, people will tend to substitute away from it or may not be able to afford it at all. And this may have negative consequences for them or for people affected by their decision. So if the price of meat went up and government gave people a bit of money, they might cut back on meat, which would have adverse effects on their children's nutrition. So we are challenging the underlying assumption that people can and do uh, always make optimal choices. And we do need to concern ourselves with what people consume. In particular, they have access to rights goods. So basic nutrition that is fundamental. Um, and we might not want to give people a choice and rather just give them the good. So in this case, food parcels, decent housing, so public goods in a sense. And then the Slutsky explanation is much more in the spirit of this, getting them back to the original bundle so that they consume the same amount of meat and other goods. So please ensure that you have a full understanding of what is happening here and then you should be good to go. Right. So... Yeah, the marks would stem from the following. The logic is to restore Hicksian real income. Um, so give people enough money so they can achieve the same level of utility, but not the same level of goods. Link this to the cash payment. Then the criticism of the utilitarian approach or just giving people cash is that people might not be able to achieve a minimum amount of necessities like food or they might make bad choices if just given cash. So there you are challenging that whole rational, independent assumption, etc. The rights-based approach would support giving them food. So there you'd make up your, you bring up, not make up, but bring those arguments of the 
rights approach saying that we have the right to basic nutrition and then the criticism of exercising that right would say that it is paternalistic so paternalism stems from so what paternalism means is government acts in the best interest of the people they think that we know what's best for the people so we will do this we will choose what's best for the people that's the whole point of paternalism or being paternalistic yeah so i just wanted to take you through that then what's next there's something else that i wanted to share i think it's on this board so yeah this is an app called whiteboard just trying to figure out how it works all right so i hope everyone's doing well and yeah we'll just do that i hope everyone knows this let's key see like how to calculate the Slutsky cv particularly from that exercise exercise 4.5 where you'd have your poor consumer your poor consumer is gets an income of 1k a month and then your rich consumer gets 50 I'm not gonna write 50k. We are economists, we need to write the full numbers. So rich consumer, poor consumer. Well, poor consumer, rich consumer. Okay. So let's just go through the Slasky CV. Um, so yeah, these are the separate money incomes. And the poor person spends, let's just take a different color. So you have your 37 percent. And you have your, okay, you have your 10%. So the poor consumer spends, ooh, that's one big zero. The poor consumer spends 37% on food, 37% of their income on food. So that's 370, right? Yeah, 370 rand. And then the rich spends 10% on food. So that would be 5,000 rands on food. Then there's a price increase of food. Um, on Yeah, so the price increase is 18%. Food prices go up or food price goes up by 18%, right? So how do we calculate the Slasky CV? So we already have our 370 that we've calculated and here we have our 5,000 rands that we calculated for the rich consumer right so how do we go that six not a zero so how do we go about that so yeah we start off by getting 18 percent of 370 which is 60, 66,6 or 66 rands and 60 cents so that's 18 percent of 370, which is 66,6, then 18% of 5,000 is 900. So 0, 0,18 times 5,000 is 900. So yeah, just to make it easy for people to follow along, I'll just do this. Writing on whiteboard, so yeah, I'm just trying my best to make sure that it looks neat, well, it's not neat, but okay something to work with um yeah so it's five thousand times zero comma yeah so this is what you'd have right here right so so yeah that would be your these would be your slasky cvs for the poor consumer and rich consumer respectively right and the question i think the next question was does your answer show that rich consumers are hurt more than the poor consumers explain. So 66 rand, 66 rand and 66 cents, it's a much bigger proportion of the poor person's income. And 900 rand out of 50,000 is a much smaller proportion, right? Um, yeah, this is actually my first, well, I read my first time using this app, but I think it's my second time using this app so i'm trying to find the eraser um yeah bear with me i'm trying here so if you were to 
I'll just probably press undo on everything because I have the numbers um, on a separate paper. But since you've been following along and this is a video, you can shut this down for yourself, but it's something that you should have done. So you should know what's going on here. Right, right. So let's take let's take these numbers in proportions. Right. Okay, this is actually a nice marker. I'm messing with this. So we have the poor consumer. We're gonna take a proportion of what they have. So 66.6 divided by so Slatsky CV divided by the income, right? Equals. Okay, let's times it by 100, eh? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that, let's do that, let's do that. I don't have my calculator on me, but I'm pretty sure what I'm doing is accurate. Yeah, well, it is because you just, because if you take two zeros and cancel them out, you can just move one back, you know, to get your percentage. So you have 6, 66 as the proportion. Then for the rich consumer, you have 900 divided by 50,000. Hey, that five actually looks neat. The rest of these numbers look ugly. Yeah, just say that, and then you should get one point. Eight. And honestly, I think if you, not even I think, once you follow this approach to explaining the different proportions, use this method to say that this is how I know that this consumer is spending a much bigger proportion compared to the other consumer, right? Um, and I'm not going to write down what I want to say, so please do pay attention. And I think you should also see why. Um, one consumer's worse off compared to the other. So 66 rand is a much bigger proportion of the poor consumer's income in comparison to the 900 to 900 versus 50,000. So, you know, if we're looking at the money, 66 rand and 60 cents compared to 900 rand, obviously 900 rand is way bigger. So that would assume that, oh, the rich is more impacted by the price increase, right? Wrong. So firstly, We've already established the proportions, right? So it's closely related to the idea that the marginal utility of money is diminishing. So one rand is worth a lot more to the poor person than the rich person because the rich person spends 5,000 on food. You know, why are you spending 5,000 on food? You can spend 1K, right? Or 2K, you know? They're probably buying platters and all that nice stuff. But uh, that's besides the point. I'm just trying to make it a bit more relatable in a sense. So that's the first part, proportion. And then just explaining that the value for money is appreciated more um, with the poor consumer. Then the second part is that the discussion of rights, if you refer to page 174, 175, um, you will just say that poor people are unlikely to have much more than the bare necessities you know and this just goes back to what i pointed out that test two guideline from last year where you speak about the choice theoretic framework so you'll just say that if their real income falls they're likely to be forced to cut back on vital things either in the food mix or things like education electricity so they don't have much of a, a choice in terms of their real income falling. Like, okay, you have to buy food because you need to eat to live, right? So maybe cut back a bit on electricity. So just being able to just buy foods that are within the income bracket. So here we need to think of choice and income as separate things. And if your income falls, you have very little money to work with. So you have to cut back on certain things. So if people's income fall, then they cannot afford certain necessities. So they are not choose. So it's no longer correct to say they are choosing. So if you choose to spend money on food rather than school fees, uh, or families are unable to provide adequate care to young children, it's not a choice, it's a dilemma. So you should be able to explain it the way I explained it, right? Um, and then think about the welfare state. Like if you want to expand further, speak about the welfare state. 
Um, so just think of the implications that come with uh, this matter in the welfare state. So state grants, pension, healthcare, education, look at countries that are welfare states. What are they doing right now? You know, which is why I'm saying you should keep up with the news. They speak about these different things. Well, not really the news per se, but research that speaks closely to this. Yeah, and then in terms of people maximizing utility, you need to state that people's decisions do have consequences for others. So for example, if the family head, the head of the household decided to spend money, like grocery money on alcohol, it would have an effect on the children in the family and at a community level, choices also affect the neighbors. Then poor people themselves may be in positions where they cannot choose. They face dilemmas, as explained earlier, and are unable to achieve things that should be theirs by right. So this would be the basic nutrition, education, etc. So you just expand on that. Then giving people a little bit of money and thinking a little bit of money is good ignores that people may not spend wisely and that a little bit of money may not be enough for basics and that certain rights simply cannot be afforded by poor people. This goes back to what um, I was saying uh, earlier, you know, that um, giving people money does not mean they'll spend it wisely, you know, in that um, example, the test two example, and look at how everything is linking. You already have the rights-based approach falling into the Slatsky explanation. And should you get this for the test, you'll, you'll come all right. It's probably going to be in the exam. Then another point. Let's not confuse welfare with charity and think about the programs that are targeted, right? Don't think of welfare as charity. Like what exactly is the government doing? What are they trying to achieve in ensuring that they are assisting their people, right? So helping people to thrive and thriving people means thriving communities and economies. So that's the catch, you know, think about it in that sense. And also think about this discourse as well, that um, welfare is more of a social investment. So a very common example is, in this is um, early learning or early childhood development. So it's important to invest in the people as it is to invest in anything that you think will get you returns, right? So if you were to invest in um, maybe a certain market of goods, like some, like a commodity, of some sort that you know will get you cake returns, um, then you would invest in that. So investing in people, remember it's human capital, it's, it's integral to invest in people um, as it is to invest like in factories and infrastructure. And that would show Jorge, you are trying to make money back. And it actually, and there's literature which actually speaks directly to this, that one of the highest returns to investment is in early learning or early childhood development. You know, like right now we are, in university and we studying for degrees do you get my point and we need to go beyond just the degrees okay so that's one thing that i wanted to address um, further all right and yeah that marks the end of the video if there are any questions do not hesitate to reach out thank you